David Biet, I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, welcome, and welcome to folks who will be watching this uh, live on the webcast or later on film. So for that reason, I will ask when you have questions later to please speak into the microphone. Um, the Wilson Center was founded in 1968 by an act of Congress. It's a living memorial to the 28th president. It unites the world of ideas and policy by convening business leaders, policy makers, scholars, and opinion leaders. The Canada Institute increases awareness and knowledge about Canada and the U.S.-Canada relationship. We were founded about 10 years ago, and we look at about three main issues, energy environment, trade, and borders and border security. One of our big projects now is uh, an observatory, if you will, observatoire, as the French say, on uh, the Beyond the Border Action Plan and the Regulatory Cooperation Council, and you can find that at our website. We're trying to uh, keep all the action that's going on with those projects um, up and in the public eye. Today, um, we are here for the launch, or the American launch, of our latest One Issue, Two Voices publication. We were in Calgary yesterday morning to do the same. Um, much nicer weather here. I think we had about five inches of snow yesterday morning, um, which we haven't seen in Washington this year. But well, this is our pub signature publication series, and it looks at one issue from both sides of the border in a written conversation. If you haven't looked, each author talks about 2,500 words, and then they answer each other, and we will follow that format today. Recent topics, and I put some of these uh, out there, are privacy and information sharing at the border, by American, by Canadian, the new protectionism, digital copyright law in Canada and the United States, water abundance in Canada and the United States, myth or reality, and today's topic, the risk and regulation of deep water offshore drilling. Um, and a promo for later this month, uh, we have a pro uh, program coming, So Canada Left Kyoto, Why and What's Next? But today I'd like a uh, special thanks to the Canadian Embassy um, and to Chevron for making the publication and today's program possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave Bernhardt. Um, you have his biography, but I'd like to point out a couple things on that. First, he's a partner at Brownstein Hyatt Farber Schreck. He spent some time in the U.S. government, was solicitor of the Department of the Interior, and what I was most interested in, which he told me, was he was appointed by President Bush to lead the International Boundary Commission between Canada and the United States, um, where he served from 2007 to 2009. So now I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation. Uh, two voices, uh, one issue. Today, two authors. James Cohen and Sandy McDonald will share their perspective on the risk of regulation, at, the risk and regulation of deep water offshore production. Sorry about that. I made a little mistake here on the slide thing. Um, the decisions by policymakers regarding risk and the regulation of deep water offshore energy production are important to our two countries. There is little dispute that in our present envi environment and for the foreseeable future. Our standard of living in both countries depends on oil to fuel the economy as well as the choices policymakers make regarding whether we produce more or less energy in North America. At the same time, the tragedy of the Macondo incident brought greater attention to the American public consciousness regarding both the perceived workplace safety risks and environmental risks associated with oil and gas development offshore. How significant or long-lasting that change in public consciousness is, particularly with the memory of Macondo fading and prices rapidly escalating at the gas pump, remains to be seen. Irrespective of the policies the U.S. and Canada develop off their waters, it is likely that we will see significant, a significant increase in production from deep water and tight oil plays to, to continue to increase in world importance. Um, the slide I just put up um, represents a slide that was just uh, presented by IHS SARA, and it represents um, the projected increase in tidal oil and deep water production worldwide. Global deep water production capacity has more than tripled since 2000. Indeed, if deep water production were viewed as its own country, it would exceed the production of every other country except for Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. It is notable that worldwide discoveries are significantly larger, on average, than new onshore discoveries. According to IHS's data, the average size of a new deep water discovery in 2009 was about 150 million uh, barrels of oil equivalent, compared to 
an onshore average of 25 million barrels. Uh, global deep water oil discoveries are increasingly important to the world reserve base. The volume of new oil reserves coming from deep water has been on an upward trend since the 1990s. And I believe from 2000 to 2009, deep water discoveries accounted for 42 to 54 percent of all discoveries onshore and offshore. In Canada, uh, according to Canadian fish officials, the Newfoundland and Labrador offshore fields are the primary source of production um, in eastern Canada, but production in this area has been declining. But this decline is expected to moderate with the addition of two large fields. I believe the Hebron field is scheduled to come on production in about 2017. Closer to home, the Canadian and U.S. policymakers have to determine whether and how they want deep water development to occur within their waters. The use of the U.S.'s choice is reflected in this map. Um, the dark blue areas represent those areas that the government has determined are available for leasing on the OCS currently. Currently, the um, and these, these maps are explained in some interesting ways by policymakers. Currently, the uh, administration looks at this map and says 75% of our resources are available for leasing. This assertion is based on an understanding of the available resources on the OCS, never mind that the resource estimates for both the Atlantic and Pacific date, actually date back to the 1980s, and the estimates for the Gulf of Mexico have gone up greatly since that time as estimates have been refined. Republicans uh, in Congress look at this map and suggest that 3.8 million of the OCS's 1.6 billion acres are actually leased, which amounts to about 2.16% 2 of the actual um, OCS. I apologize for not having a counterpart map for Canada, but simply put, in both the U.S. and Canada, policymakers have made a choice, a conscious decision to allow for the production of some oil from deep water drilling in a relatively small portion of their respective onshore waters. Once policymakers decide uh, to allow any production on the Outer Continental Shelf, then they face a multitude of, of additional questions that must come with the development program. What portions of the OCS will be opened? Who should decide what portions are available for de development? What are the terms of such development? Uh, does an executive agency make these decisions? The federal government, perhaps a local, local government entity. Who should collect the royalty and revenue? What level of government? And how should that money be apportioned? How should uh, activity be regulated to adequately provide for workplace safety? and to protect the environment, and what is adequate. This morning, our presenters will discuss the choices policymakers in the United States and Canada have made to address these issues. I expect that we will hear a perspective on the strengths and flaws of the respective systems and what the authors believe might be appropriate policy changes going forward. I look forward to hearing their perspectives, their interaction with each other on their particular programs, and then questions from all of you. Let's get to the main event. First, I would like to introduce uh, Jim Co James Cohen. James serves as a research associate uh, for the Energy Forum at James Baker A., the third public institute for public policy. His research interests include quite a broad range, renewable energy, U.S. Tr strategic policy and international relations, and of course, uh, offshore production. James will provide the American perspective of our program, and then we will turn to Sandy. Um, who is a managing partner of the St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador office of Cox Palmer, an Atlantic Canadian, Canadian law firm where he specializes in energy matters. Sandy has acted for governments on offshore royalty and other policy matters, and in the private, he now represents private sector developers as well. Uh, James, proceed. Okay, great. So yeah, uh, good morning. This is a, a nice homecoming for me. I, I grew up uh, just outside of Bethesda and went to Walter Johnson High School. And uh, my major in college at Princeton was actually in the Woodrow Wilson School, so it's very mm. appropriate. Uh, and uh, you'll you'll notice that uh, both my presentation and Sandy's are a little bit different from most. Uh, we actually both think that the 
regulatory uh, structures in both of our countries are quite good. And I assume that a lot of the presentations that you see are fairly depressing, like, oh, you know, this is terrible, and we don't know how it's going to change. There's all this you know, partisanship. But we think that it, it's, it's quite good. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, so there are four parts to the presentation. Uh, like the introduction, I'll, I'll give some numbers. Hopefully it won't be too much of a barrage of, of numbers for you this early in the morning. Uh, talk about regulation before Deepwater Horizon, uh, give some examples of how it's changed, and then provide some conclusions. Uh, so this is a graph of, expect of previous and expected production in the U.S. Uh, from the Energy Information Administration. And the, the dark middle, the, the dark blue in the middle, uh, represents offshore production. And the Gulf of Mexico accounts for almost all of that production, more than 90%. And the EIA projects that Gulf of Mexico production will increase a little bit uh, from today's levels and go up to about 2 million barrels a day. And it will account for roughly a quarter to a third of, of production. And by the 2030s, Decline a little bit, and and most of this is deep water, uh, offshore, which is usually defined as a thousand feet of water, or more. Uh, this is a slide that you just saw a few minutes ago. Now with slightly different color scheme, uh, and also some numbers about the the resources, which yes could increase as more exploration occurs and and more resources are are discovered. Uh, but it, as you can see, the, the biggest areas in terms of the, the known resources are open. Uh, so the central Gulf of Mexico and then uh, the two regions offshore north of Alaska. So after Deepwater Horizon, uh, there was a huge inquiry into what went wrong. And more than the, this, uh, this is a cover of the uh, report to the president from the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and offshore drilling. Uh, it's more than 350 pages long, and this is just kind of a laundry list of some of the issues that it uncovered, although there, there were even more problems that it described in great depth. Uh, so first thing was that there were conflicting goals. There's just one agency that, that oversaw all of offshore production, the Mineral Management Service, uh, and it dealt with both revenue and oversight, and this was seen as a, a conflict of interest. Uh, there are poor regulations. There, so there's this difference between prescriptive regulations and goal-oriented regulations. Prescriptive is just, you know, you must have this. You must have a handrail. Your, your blowout preventer must have these features. It's like a, it's a big checklist. And it's very hard to keep up uh, since this is a very dynamic industry. There's a lot of technological innovation. And it's very challenging to go in, in deep waters and, and drill there. Whereas goal-oriented regulation, which is seen in the UK and Norway, uh, puts the, the industry it gives them more leeway, more say as to how the uh, regulation will actually happen. They have to figure out the best ways to do it, and and they're required to think you know, in more instead of just going through a checklist. They have to think more creatively about how they're going to drill safely and environmentally uh, friendly way. Uh, the funding had remained very flat and actually de had declined since the 1980s, even as uh, drilling became uh, more prevalent and more challenging. There were fewer inspections, fewer inspectors to inspect these rigs, uh, and lots of problems just with the inspections. There used to be lots of unannounced inspections, and those had basically ended, and there were very few regulators, uh, so one for every 54 facilities in the Gulf. Uh, it was difficult to recruit, and it still is to some degree because of uncompetitive salaries. Uh, there wasn't a training system, uh, so there was no formal 
training and MMS didn't define exactly what uh, regulators were supposed to know. And there were fairly low standards. Some of these were budgetary issues, but blowout preventers, for instance, weren't really uh, looked at. They, they, they tested them, but not as much as they were supposed to, and they kind of trusted the industry that they were going to work, and clearly they didn't. Uh, so the most obvious changes from the outside have been structural. So instead of just one mineral management service, now there are three different agencies. Uh, initially, it was broken into two. It was Office of Natural Resources Revenue and then what was known as BOMER. Uh, and basically, that eliminated this conflict between collecting revenues and, and regulating. And since then, in October, BOMER split into BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and BESI, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And I think the, the best way to, to think about this is that it's just kind of in terms of a, a chronology of, of how you have to drill. So BOEM kind of deals with the early uh, stuff. So manages the development of resources. There's a, a five-year leasing schedule, and it oversees that. Uh, it, the leasing uh, schedule is scheduled to end in, uh, at the end of June, and then there'll be another five years going through 2017. Uh, it deals with environmental studies uh, and deals with economic an analysis. So it's kind of the, er the early, more general uh, issues. And then the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement enforces the regulations, deals with fi field operations. This is where you have inspectors. And if there were another oil spill, they would be in, in charge of the response. Uh, here are some of the, the leaders. Uh, Michael Bromwich is the leader of, of BOMER. You probably heard his name a lot. And here's the, the other leaders of these different uh, new federal agencies. And here's another kind of long list of, of things that have changed uh, since Deepwater Horizon. Uh, now there are more goal-oriented regulations. So there's this uh, SEMS, or Safety and Environmental Management System where companies have to identify risks. There are some new prescriptive regulations, and we had a conference at the Baker Institute. Prescriptive regulations aren't bad, they're just probably insufficient on their own. Uh, so these rules deal with casing and cementing and, and different uh, specific aspects of the drilling process. Uh, there's now more oversight. There's a committee to give recommendations on, on how to regulate going forward. Uh, applications have to be more complete rather than just copying things from Wikipedia. Uh, and what's pretty amazing is the, in this age often of austerity and uh, budget cuts, the budgeting for offshore regulation has really gone up quite dramatically. Uh, it was uh, a little over 200 million uh, before Deepwater Horizon, and now across the, the three agencies, it's about $500 million in Obama's recent budget proposal. And o Obama's budget proposal isn't that different than what was actually appropriated uh, for fiscal year 12. Uh, and there are about uh, twice as many inspectors as there were, and they're receiving better training. So there's a National Offshore Training Center. Uh, so in conclusion, I mean, we think that these changes are, for the most part, are quite good. And uh, there have been a lot of permits granted. I mean, you can see the, these numbers. If you can read it, 69 exploration plans, have been approved since the moratorium ended, 113 new shallow water uh, drilling permits, 370 deep water permits. This is about the, the rate of permitting that was occurring before Deepwater Horizon. Uh, so yes, industry needs to take more time to complete its applications, but there are also more people to look at the applications. So they, they've increased, it seems, at roughly the, the same rate. and. Uh, offshore drilling uh, can occur. Uh, we don't think it's perfect, so we, we give three uh, ways that we think it could improve. Uh, we believe that 
this uh, move toward goal-oriented regulation should continue. Uh, we think that the UK and Norway really have the gold standard uh, for having this, this goal-oriented regulation process. Um, we think that there should be some kind of, of program, uh, Sandy will describe it in more detail in, in Canada, where there would be an ability to prevent companies at least from bidding on leases if they had a repeated history of many, many safety failures. This would just be an, an added incentive for industry to do well. And, and finally, uh, we think the liability cap should be raised from $75 million. Uh, clearly, if there were another Deepwater Horizon, uh, the company would have to waive its liability cap. I mean, BP has, has done that. And if you've been following the news, there's all these different billions of dollars, a settlement where they think they're going to pay $7.8 billion. They might get fined from 5 to $20 billion. They've already, you know, they, they set aside $20 billion. They think they're going to have to pay $37 billion. I mean, just all these numbers that are all start with B, billion. Uh, and this is a liability cap of $75 million. Uh, so this would be for a more, uh, you know, for a smaller uh, type accident, uh, but, but still give you another incentive uh, for companies to, to drill in a responsible way. Well, thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you. I wonder if I could have the yeah. oh, the, the remote. Not that I'll follow my That's slides fine. very uh, carefully. Uh, while that's coming up, um, although I am a lawyer, and uh, in my part of the world, the accent almost always calls that a liar. Uh, but in any event, I, I'm a lawyer, and I deal primarily with the uh, energy industry, which is run by engineers generally. And I do have a degree in civil engineering. And I always remember my first client in the industry looking at me, an engineer, saying, how do you get a lawyer out of a tree? I looked at him, and he said, you cut the rope. <laughs> So with that said, with my engineering degree, um, they look at me a little less suspiciously. They think I can't be completely useless. I must have some uh, um, worth to them. Um, so what I'd like to do, talk to you today, is where do I point this? I want to talk to you about uh, these topics. Uh, and what I want to really focus on is the Canadian regulatory approach, uh, how it is handled in each of our three coasts, and what lessons we might learn together, how that can allow offshore uh, drilling to proceed safely and to the benefit of all parties. First thing I'd like to talk about is what are we really talking about when we talk about risk? Uh, in the industry, uh, safety individuals, uh, safety people always talk about the physical risk. And what they mean by risk is they mean the risk to the environment or to people. So that's the physical risk, a risk that we clearly understand. But from a public policy perspective, that is not uh, a, a broad enough view of what risks are. There's many other risks associated with uh, drilling offshore, and uh, here's some of them. There's environmental physical risks, the ones we just talked about. These are clearly understood, and this is what the public actually thinks about when they, they say, what is the risk of offshore drilling? But there's others. There's economic risk. There is a, a serious uh, risk to our ec economies if we cannot maintain our energy supplies. And it has to be considered in, uh, in the context of offshore drilling. There's, there's political risk in the sense that if we don't produce our own energy, we're going to be uh, buying energy from unstable political regimes. And uh, we know the risks associated with that. There's ethical risks. And even if they're not politically unstable, we can be buying oil from uh, unsavory regimes, let's say Sudan or uh, Iran, we uh, know this. So there's ethical risks associated with this as well. And finally, there's what I would call a regulatory risk, which in this context means we know the regulatory environment under which we produce energy. We know that it's a stable, in my, uh, in my view, safe environment uh, when regulation is in enacted for the right motivation, for the betterment of the uh, the, the people and the, uh, the environment and the economy, and not for uh, un unsuitable or unethical reasons. So I think we have to look at risk in the offshore drilling in a much broader context. If we do not look at it in this context, what we're really doing is we're transferring these issues to others. 
So while we drive our SUVs and live our very uh, energy uh, intensive lifestyles, people who oppose offshore drilling without good solid reason to do so are effectively transferring these issues to someone else. In other words, not my problem. Let's deal with, I'll send it to Alberta. Let's send it to the Sudan. Let's send it to Venezuela. So these are very important issues, I think, uh, in which we must context, uh, discuss the context of what is acceptable risk in the offshore. So I think there are some lessons to be learned uh, in Canada for the United States. Uh, first of all, though, before I start that, there are some important and significant differences in between Canada and the U.S. First of all, in Canada, drilling offshore is not a partisan political issue in the sense that it is not an issue in the federal level between the various political parties, a conservative versus liberal or however you want to characterize that. Although the offshore uh, outside of the high water mark is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the federal government, the debate always centers in Canada between the federal government and the provincial governments or the local governments. It is a state's right issue in the context of the U.S. It's the provinces either oppose or, or uh, are in favor of drilling, and the federal government, which has the jurisdiction, is in this continual debate with the provinces. So if we look at it in that context, we really have three models in Canada, uh, which are, um, you might look at it as a, as a, a mini U.S. issue. Uh, the industry is much smaller in Canada than it is in the United States, but there are three different uh, scenarios in Canada that we could look at to see, well, why and how does offshore uh, development occur? The first one I want to talk about is British Columbia. British Columbia, we often call in Canada the California of Canada. It's on the west coast, and for those who don't know it, it's just north of Washington and just south of Alaska. And it is, uh, has a large coastal area, um, characterized by a lot of estuaries and inland seas. So this is in the Pacific Ocean. The currents go from north to south down towards California. This area has been under federal moratorium for offshore drilling since 1972, primarily driven by local provincial concerns. And those concerns are primarily driven by environmental reasons and no others. Uh, so in, the, in California, this is the California of Canada. It, I understand this is pretty much as what is happening in, in most of the U.S. There's just no appetite locally for uh, opening these lands to offshore drilling. The second model is the east coast of Canada. And for those who don't know it, uh, Maine is just next to New Brunswick here. So this is northeast of Maine, about a two-hour flight from New York City uh, to where I live, which is on the extreme east coast. And this is in the North Atlantic. Uh, this is a very hostile environment. This is the longest settled part of Canada. It's been settled for about 500 years by Europeans, much longer than that by the Aboriginal people. And it has a long history of exploiting resources from the offshore, uh, primarily fish and seals, and, and it's a very natural resource product uh, uh, in environment. It's historically been the poorest part of Canada. This is an area in which, uh, which crystallized the discussion in Canada of who has jurisdiction of the offshore uh, area. There was a Supreme Court of case, a Canada case that decided this in the late 80s. It was a bitterly fought case, and it determined that Canada, the federal government, owned these lands. And this was very bitterly fought in Canada. Constitutional debates in Canada are, are your Republican, Democratic uh, rows. We just, they're, they're very bitterly fought. And as a result, a political accommodation was made with the eastern provinces whereby jurisdiction was shared. The federal government owns a resource, but the grand bargain that was struck, and I think it's important uh, in that it has allowed offshore development to occur and might be a model for the U.S., the grand bar bargain that was struck was this. All royalties from the offshore would be uh, allocated to the adjacent province or state in your context. So, for example, in Newfoundland, uh, all royalties from the offshore are directly go to the, the, the provincial treasury, not the federal treasury. The province has a joint say in the management of the offshore, and by that is they've created an offshore petroleum board that's a regulator, and the regulator uh, is appointed jointly by the, the province and the federal government, 
and over certain key decisions, the provincial government, through their uh, Minister of Natural Resources, has a veto. And one of the, the certain key decisions that is very important is that the, the province must agree to the way the, the project is developed, the so-called mode of development. So without the provincial uh, sign-off to that decision, no project can proceed. So what is the effect of all that? It's a little more complicated than that. I could spend three hours in Canadian constitutional politics, but essentially the province and the people adjacent to the resource have a very large say in the process. They obtain all the revenue. The, through their, their provincial government can approve or reject the mode of development. So there is a, uh, what the, the effect of this is, is instead of the decision turning into a very narrow environmental and physical safety issue, which is only one of the many risks that we have to look at, it expands the discussion into what, what are the economic risks, what are the benefits? You know, what, are the, what, what it does is it invests the local people in the discussion of whether or not this project should proceed. And the effect of that is, you can understand completely, if someone was drilling oil in my backyard and I wasn't getting the royalties but it was going to someone else down the street, worse, to the federal government, we would never approve it. There would be, there would be massive objection to this. But because the provincial government and the people of the province have the prime beneficiary of the, of the offshore, um, there is a much stronger public movement to open these uh, areas to exploration. So this is extremely important. We have to get people beyond the physical uh, risk and look at the broader risks in the broader context. That's not to say that the physical risk is negotiable. In other words, I'll, I'll take more risk if I can get more money. That's not the consideration. I mean, uh, the physical risk is table stakes to this game. You have to come with that. You have to come with your plan. But what has happened in Canada on the West Coast in British Columbia, the risk is always the physical risk. And they have determined that any risk is too much risk, which is a misunderstanding of risk. On the east, uh, east coast of the country, a uh, part of the country longer settled, always uh, re exploited these resources um, for 500 years. Many people have lost their lives fishing, <coughs> similar to, say, I would say, New England. They understand that all activity has risk. So they have to look at risk in a broader context. So I would suggest to you that this sort of model, which sees uh, benefits uh, uh, coming to the local people, is a very important uh, aspect of why offshore drilling is permitted in uh, the east coast of Canada. And it's not by accident that there's only uh, the only projects uh, in Canada are on this coast. There's three in offshore Newfoundland at about uh, 250 miles offshore. They're very far offshore. It's quite shallow water. It's only about 200 feet. Um, Chevron, who is the sponsor here today, are drilling in much, much deeper water, uh, around 2,800 meters or <coughs> 8,000 feet, uh, and about 300, 450 kilometers or uh, whatever that is, uh, about 300 miles offshore. There is also gas projects in Nova Scotia, which is the province closer uh, to you here. Um, gas is always less controversial because the consequences of a blowout are, are less. Um, it's an important distinction here as well that because of where this is, there's almost no risk of oil spills coming ashore. This is in the North Atlantic. The currents are away from North America. It's very likely uh, in the studies they've shown that there would never be a, a landfall. So it's a little bit different. Then we have the uh, last part of the Canadian coastline, which is the Arctic, right next to uh, Alaska, which would be on your, your upper left. This is a huge area of Canada. And this is in uh, flux. The reason it's in flux is because the federal government has not made accommodations with the local governments as to how the benefits will be shared. So right now, this is administered entirely by the federal government uh, through through two departments, very similar uh, to the U.S. situation now. And there is a lot of debate happening right now as to whether drilling will be permitted in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the current government is the view it should be, but the local peoples here, which is made more complicated by the fact that uh, the majority of the people in this part of the world have been there for thousands of years, and they want a stake in this uh, process. So the, the East Coast model could work well here. So the, the advantage Canada has 
over the United States in this issue. I would suggest to you where, one, there's been a, uh, an investment in the local population in the risks and benefits of the project. That's an important, very important issue. Two, the revenue is a, uh, attributable entirely to the local uh, government and not to the federal government. This makes people interested uh, in looking at these projects in a broader context. doesn't mean they have to approve them, but they can look at them in the broader context. And we all know that we're, no one's interested in destroying your own property for the benefit of someone else. So I think these are very important considerations. So setting that aside, the, the real question then is once you get over how do you engage the public in looking at risk in a broader context as opposed to I will not accept any risk, which is the British Columbia view and I suggest to you large parts of the U.S., the next question goes, well, let's see if we can get over that problem. Is the regulation of deep water drilling sufficient to protect the public and the environment? Um, and to answer that question, I think there's two parts of that question that are important. The first question is, you can have the great, greatest regulation in the world. Is the regulator in some sort of conflict of interest that prevents it from doing its duty? That is a situation that appeared to uh, have occurred in the U.S. in the sense that the Mineral Management Service, the MMS, had a dual mandate to administer the offshore, technically in, in, in a regulatory fashion, but it also had a mandate to collect the royalties. Uh, in Canada, this has not occurred. The province, the provinces collect royalties. The regulator has nothing to do with collecting royalties. Uh, the regulator has nothing to do with promoting the industry. That is the mandate of governments. So there is absolutely no discussion ever. I've been at the, the regulator very often. The, the issue of money never comes up. They don't care. And you can see how that can create a conflict of interest because when most offshore regimes, there's, a, there's always a discussion, the money I've spent on that well, can I collect it again, claim it against my royalties? They're, they're called net profit interest royal leases, which is very common in, in the U.S. as well, offshore. And what it means essentially is you deduct from your, your, your revenue the costs that you put in the well. So there's always a discussion with the province and the royalty collector, that's too much money, you spent too much, you gold plated that, uh, I wasn't going to allow that expense. That was spent in, you know, Ontario. It should have been spent in Newfoundland. This is an absolute conflict of interest because when you're doing the drilling activity, you can't be in a, in a thinking in the back of your mind, well, I, I have to discuss with the regulator whether I'll put that blow in, uh, blowout preventer in or the other one because one is cheaper than the other and will they allow it against royalty. So this has never occurred in Canada. Royalty is nothing to do with the regulator. The regulator also has some significant powers that uh, the U.S. regulator does not occur, it does not have. It, uh, both offshore regulators, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, have independent safety officers who, are, who, who have the power to do a series of things, but ultimately they can s order an immediate secession of any activity on the offshore. So if that's a production facility, they can shut it down on his say-so or her say-so. They can stop drilling activity on the spot. They have a series of other things that are, you would expect. They have audit rights. They have a right for uh, snap inspections, all of which they do. But ultimately, the chief safety officer can close down the activity. The second uh, important aspect of the offshore petroleum boards are that they have a, a legislative mandate. Money is not mentioned. The first uh, mandate is safety to the environment and to, the, to, p to persons. That's number one. Uh, they, number two is the conservation of the resource. For those familiar with the oil fields, you have to ensure that it's properly developed so uh, there's not oil left in the ground that shouldn't, should have uh, been produced. They have a legal ad, uh, uh, responsibility to administer the land title system, which is just a, a property right. Uh, and that is their mandate. Nowhere is it mentioned about money. So there is a very strong safety culture within the board, and that is their primary mandate. The, the second thing that happens uh, that I, I think people aren't aware of is before any activity occurs in the offshore, a series of things have to be done. And, and you have to get an authorization from the regulators to do essentially anything. But what you have to do before you even start is you have to have filed a safety plan, you have to have filed an environmental plan and a response plan if there are situations, and they're complicated, but they, they have three or four levels. You have to file what is called a certificate of fitness. 
And this is certificates uh, primarily from independent agencies. The American Bureau of Shipping is one, Lloyd's of London is another, DNV, a Norwegian company is another. And they specialize in certifying that the equipment used is fit for purpose. And underneath that certificate are required certificates from the various regulators, the FAA for helicopters uh, and Transport Canada, a series of others. So you require a certificate of fitness. The third thing you must have is a, a, a proof of financial responsibility. In Canada, liability is limited to $30 million without negligence, in other words, an act of God. In my view, such a circumstance will never occur. Liability is unlimited for fault, for negligence or fault. Uh, the board also requires posting a security, uh, and they require consolidated financial statements to look through holding companies to the parent. So there is a, a strong incentive uh, financially to do the right thing. Uh, then there's a technical review of the well design that's required. And the well design, as you know, is a very complicated matter. It depends on the depth, it depends on the pressures encountered, it depends on a series of other things. And these are independently certified by the board. So the powers are all there. There's no doubt in my mind the powers are all there. Uh, the question is, are they being used properly? Uh, I would like to talk a little bit now about two examples in Canada that, that can show both a failure of the safety system and a success of the, the safety system. There are two incidents re uh, recently that sort of brought this entire issue to fore. Uh, three years ago, there was a crash of a helicopter in the offshore. And as a result of that, there were 16 people killed, which is a significant loss of life. There was a, a complex inquiry held, and at the end, they concluded that there should have been an independent safety uh, board created to deal with safety and environmental issues, very similar to what has happened in the MS MMS. Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, my view is the uh, creation of an independent safety board when there is no existing conflict of interest, like collecting royalties, is a political response. I really do believe that. Because you cannot design uh, a well, or you cannot certify helicopters without uh, a broad knowledge of the industry. So let's just talk about the helicopter crash. Mm -hmm. They concluded that there should be an independent safety board, and that might have prevented that helicopter crash. This was a helicopter crash. What happened is it lost pressure in its main gearbox. The pilots mistakenly thought they had 30 minutes to get to shore because of a certification provided by the FAA. The <coughs> FAA had always mandated that helicopters must have a 30-minute dry time run time. What the, by that is if the, they lost all their oil in their gearbox, it should run for 30 minutes. So the pilots thought it will run for 30 minutes. In fact, the FAA had certified that that could be waived because that was impossible or extremely improbable to occur. So the pilots flew back to shore, trying to get to shore rather than land in the North Atlantic, and crashed after 12 minutes. So it was a misunderstanding of the certification process. What could a safety board possibly have done about that? A helicopter is certified by the FAA, and then Transport Canada accepts the certification of the FAA as the manufacturing nation. A safety board for an offshore petroleum uh, industry is supposed to get into whether a helicopter is properly certified by the FAA is ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. They don't have the expertise, and no one would expect them to have the expertise. So this recommendation that there be an independent safety board is to satisfy a shallow political interest and has nothing to do with reality. And I'll, I'll just put you to the second sort of success story. Chevron has drilled a well in 2,800 meters, maybe even two now. Someone here from Chevron could probably tell me the number astronomically expensive undertakings, about uh, 400 miles offshore. And they went through the process we just talked about. Uh, the board has required that there be a relief vessel be available within two weeks if they need a relief well. The board uh, does uh, spot inspections of the, uh, the well process. The, be the, the board has to certify the, the or approve the, the blow-up preventers. So let's talk about the blow-up preventers. So we have an independent safety uh, board. They're supposed to opine on whether the, the blow-up preventer is suitable. These are four-story, very technical pieces of equipment. They cannot be designed except in the context of the well design. They cannot be 
interpreted or approved without understanding the mechanics <coughs> of an undersea well. The board, the petroleum board, which does all these things, is now going to pass this over to the safety board, and they're going to say, well, is this blowout preventer suitable? It's impossible. It's ludicrous. So again, it's a, a, a political requirement, and I suggest to you that there's no need for a safety board. The real question you have to ask is, is there a conflict between the board and uh, that would prevent it from doing its mandate? And I, I applaud the U.S. for taking royalty out of it because royalty is a conflict. But in the absence of that, improve your regulator. Don't create another one. Um, so the third uh, or fourth thing that's important in Canada is uh, James has talked about in this paper about goal-based regulation. Canada in 2009 moved to goal-based regulation in um, the offshore. In other words, the goal-based regulation, for those that are not familiar with it, there will be a general statement that uh, the driller must maintain control of the well at all times in a safe manner uh, consistent with environmental safety, some general statement like that. And there will be 30 of these general statements in the regulation. They don't tell you how to do that. And that's very important because if you tell people how to do it, in year one, it might be fine. In year 10, you're hopelessly out of date. It's a regulatory process similar to the U.S. It takes months and years to change regulations. Uh, so the, the goal-based regulation is a very positive uh, move forward. It allows the industry to make a recommendation subject, of course, to the board oversight. So I would suggest to you that the Canadian system has some advantages. It has two. One, it, it encourages a political resolution to allow drilling in the offshore, and two, which is table stakes. It has a robust uh, regulatory environment topped by the fact that the safety officer can stop this activity at any time. Now, what are the drawbacks of this system? Uh, we are a federal state, similar to the U.S. Uh, states' rights issues in the U.S. are on steroids in Canada. The provinces are extremely uh, jealous of their, their uh, powers. In Canada, the political system is much more centered, decentralized, much more centered to the provincial uh, government. Uh, the problem with this is Canada has 13 administrative territories, provinces, and there's a, a couple of uh, territories administered by Canada. Eleven of them have coastlines. That would require 11 offshore petroleum boards. If anyone ever were to ever accept that there has to be a safety, independent safety board, it would require another 11 safety boards. That would be 222 administrators, uh, regulators. We can barely staff two. And the reason we can barely staff two is this is highly uh, technical uh, expertise. And two, the federal government uh, and the governments will not pay even close to what the industry pays these same technical experts. So someone who knows something about uh, blow-up preventers will make two to three to four times in the industry what he will make in government. So we can't, we can't staff all these uh, um, uh, regulators. So the challenge in this, how does this work if you were to translate this even broader in Canada into the U.S.? The challenge is the local regulator uh, is going to create huge stresses for the federal government as to, the, as to how they decide to administer the offshore generally. However, a move away to a national regulator, as is, uh, exists in the U.S., uh, I wouldn't say it will cause a civil war, but it will cause <laughs> huge strains in the Federation, and it will not occur. It will not occur. It just cannot occur. The, the provinces will never allow it to occur, and it will become politically impossible for the government to, uh, to do. So that's the real challenge. Uh, how this really translates to the U.S., and I think uh, James talked about in this paper. It's all great to talk about these political accommodations, but we can't do that in the U.S. We don't have the, the decentralized government that Canada has. But all in all, I think it's a, a robust system. The S Canadian Senate also had hearings after the Gulf of Mexico disaster and made a very similar conclusion that they were the view that the regulatory regime in Canada was safe. There was no reason at all to, uh, to stop offshore drilling. But I think the real challenge for all of us f who are in favor of offshore drilling, which uh, I think you can tell from my tone I probably am, is that you can't do it without local support. How do you get local support? Safety is table stakes. Environmental safety is table stakes. Um, but how do you get the, the political support to move forward? And, and my thesis is that is only done if the local inhabitants have a say and 
can have a has something to gain from this process as opposed to seeing the oil drilled off Maine to go to California, who refuse to allow it to be drilled there because they don't care if it's polluted in, in Maine. So that's the, the fundamental problem we have. So thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, the next part of our program, quickly, I'll give both authors uh, a chance to respond to each other. So James? Uh. Uh, well, I guess there's a lot to respond to. Uh, no, but I mean, in, in, in general, in general, I mean, we, we we tend to agree. I mean, I don't think that the the Canadian regulatory environment should be directly exported to the U.S. or vice versa. And Sandy was getting into these points about how uh, Canada is more decentralized, so the federal government's going to have more of a role in the U.S. And I think that's fine. I don't think there's anything terrible about this. I mean, the 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 point that that I would uh, dis discuss a little bit more is actually goes way back to the beginning of, of Sandy's presentation when you talk about risk. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's good to think about risk in, in many contexts, but you know, if, if a particular place uh, decides not to allow drilling, you know, what are the consequences of that? Well, it would tend to increase, you know, I, I think of it in terms of probability or tendencies that would, would tend to occur. Uh, so, if you don't allow drilling in one place, it would tend to increase the price of oil, which would tend to increase the incentives to go elsewhere. But it's not like if you go one place, you'll definitely go somewhere else and you're definitely exporting it. The price could go up and there could be just less production. That also increases the incentive to invest in, in say, you know, some al alternatives as well, and that can be an incentive for and someone who doesn't really want offshore drilling nearby uh, to encourage that, the, the amount that the, the oil price is going to go up could be you know, relatively small. Where risk comes in is the possibility of an oil shock, that if you decrease the gap between oil supply and oil demand and something goes wrong in the very volatile Middle East, you, know, you increase your, your chances of, of facing uh, an oil shock, and that oil shock could be larger. Uh, in terms of policy, does this difference in terms of only focusing on risk and exporting uh, where production occurs or all these different mechanisms for what can happen that also go through price? Does it make much of a policy difference? I'm not sure, but I mean, that would be a clarification that I would make. Well, thank you. Sandy? Well, I, I would disagree with that. I'm, look at the U.S. today. It's in severe financial trouble. The current account is ridiculous. At some point, things come home to roost. And to me, uh, the discussion, I think there's much more immediate consequences to that. If you develop your own resource or you import it from someone else. And at some point, the price has to be paid for that. The U.S. has a reserve currency now and can still run massive current account deficits. At some point, that may change. So to me, it's, it's the, the ultimate luxury of the rich. I will allow someone else to get their hands dirty. I'll import it from somewhere else. I don't have to think about how, how babies are made. I'll just turn on my car and it'll work. To me, that's a very narrow uh, interpretation of risk. Uh, when I think that you have to look at the long-term consequences to a nation, that it, it's a hostage to oil from other places and requires investment in lives and money in other places to protect that resource, to me, it's insane. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. When you can do it safely uh, and consistent with the environment, as I say, that's table stakes. That has, that has to be demonstrated. But once you've done that, what is the reason to not do this? You know, and I, I, I just see people in British Columbia sitting down having their latte and turning on the cars to drive home. Someone has to produce this, and why isn't it uh, ourselves? And this is the beauty of the political process. Um, with that, I think we can turn it over for a few questions, sir. Uh, my name is Jojo. Your call's coming up one. Your call? Right here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Dukert. I'm uh, an energy policy analyst, um, independent. Uh, but a senior associate uh, in political economy with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, thanks to the Canada Institute for arranging this uh, and to the speakers uh, for uh, a very enlightening presentations. I think that both Canada and the United States can only benefit uh, by exchange of views uh, between the two countries about uh, uh, such matters. Uh, my question pertains to a third country in North America, Mexico. Uh, the reason I ask is that I, I would welcome any of the three panelists to comment uh, on the recent agreement between the United States and Mexico uh, about managing uh, drilling uh, along the border within the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which uh, the full text, so far as I know, has, has still not been released. Uh, but uh, I wonder if, if you have any comments about uh, what the statements of issuance said uh, about uh, safety requirements, environmental uh, awareness, and so on, in uh, possible joint ventures that straddle the border down there. And... Uh, uh, since uh, money does uh, appear uh, on, the, on, the, on the table, uh, if, uh, if uh, any of you uh, would care to comment about the significance of potentially opening uh, that, that strip uh, within the Gulf of Mexico to exploration in the future, particularly after the Mexican elections in July. Uh, in July. In July. Uh, so I don't know tremendous number of details uh, about this particular agree agreement. I know it's it's sort of troubling from the outside since Mexico doesn't allow uh, a lot of outside players to get involved and Mexico, Pemex doesn't really have much internal capacity to go into deep water. So there's a concern that you know, when you take baby steps, sometimes you fall over. And you know, you don't really you know, want to take a, a lot of of risk, so I know reading it, it, it unnerved me initially upon <laughs> upon seeing that. Uh, but beyond that, I don't I don't know much more. You wish to comment in any way? No, I don't. I don't know anything about the next uh, I was just going to say something about um, access and bilateral the bilateral agreement. Um, I think it's 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 interesting that it occurred. Um, I think. Uh, the Department of the Interior and Mexico have a long history of working with the State Department on a variety of bilateral agreements uh, relating to other natural resources, water, for example. Um, and I think the statements that have been made by both sides to date are largely political documents. And at the end of the day, you're looking at a um, situation that will impact a fairly finite area of the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that, truthfully, there are probably only a few uh, uh, large players on the United States side that are impacted as well. And so I think it's, I think it's a great political document, but its actual impact is, is relatively marginal from my perspective. In the back. Thank you, Paul Connors from the Canadian Embassy. Thank you both uh, for your presentation. Um, I agree with Sandy's point that uh, if you want to expand offshore, buy-in by adjacent communities is key, and that's not only having the industry locally. Uh, it is the issue of uh, royalties. Uh, so I'm wondering if I can, uh, both of you on that point. First, Sandy, uh, and I apologize if my knowledge is at a date, uh, the provinces collects 100% of the royalty in Canada. My understanding, and this might have been changed, is that there's a netting back to the federal government on the, on the uh, federal transfer payment calculation. So is it accurate to say that the province keeps 100% of the royal, well, they do physically keep it, but my understanding is there's a calculation that for every dollar of royalty, they would lose X cents on their federal. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's still the case in Canada. And then for James in the U.S., for the areas under moratorium in the United States, one of the carrots that's been suggested, including by state, uh, state representatives or federal representatives of these states, I'm thinking of Senator Landrieu of Louisiana, which is said in moratoria areas, because right now I think the first three miles belongs to the states, and after that it's exclusive federal, and there's no sharing of royalty. And some politicians in the United States said, well, if you incentivize that it's not only getting a local industry, but it's also sharing of that royalty between the two levels of government, uh, you might see that risk calculation done differently. Anyway, you have both of your perspectives. Uh, you're right. A couple of things on the royalty. Uh, important elements is the, the province sets the royalty rates. Uh, 
which is very important. The, the federal government doesn't do so. And U.S. royalty rates are extremely low by international standards. So the, the province can set that rate. Uh, the second part of your question is yes, that can be so-called clawed back. Uh, in Canada, there's a system of equalization, it's called, where the federal government funds provinces with less fiscal capacity. And if you're receiving equalization funds, the government can fund back. Uh, it, they don't do it directly, but if, if your fiscal capacity improves because of uh, offshore royalties, which it does, the royalties in Newfoundland are quite large relative to the U.S. royalties for a small, much smaller industry. In the, in the billions of dollars in Newfoundland, I think, you said today that the U.S. Uh, collects $11 billion for the entire Gulf of Mexico, which is, strikes me as extremely small. So there can be some netting back. Another very important consideration, though, is income tax. Uh, income tax is also, under the arrangements made um, in the industry, allocated to the province. The federal income tax is divided to, uh, to the province. So it can be netted back. There have been political accommodations with that. Various governments have pushed off that uh, or, or suspended the, the clawback, and that's been adjusted with each budget as, as in this case, Newfoundland becomes much more prosperous. They, they get off the equalization payment. They're no longer entitled to it. So there is, there's a complex interdimension. I think there's like four people in the world who understand it. Uh, you might be one of them. But there, it, it's not 100% of the revenues, but it has been for large parts of the in the time the industry has been running 100% of the revenues because of accommodations made in the federal budget. You want to respond to revenue sharing? So, so yeah, I'm going to take the uh, – I'm going to uh, answer it in a political sense, and, and then David can tell you about legally whether that could be done. Uh, I mean, politically, you know, the federal government uh, – sets out what areas can be leased. Uh, and there's a long history where both coasts, you know, the east and west coast, you, you can't drill off there. I assume if states were able to vote on it and, and say, you know, do we want offshore drilling, you would probably get it in the south, uh, off the South Atlantic. You know, so generally more Republican areas are gonna be more favorable to drilling. I mean, these are, you know, the north, the northeast, uh, and and the west coast both tend to be fairly liberal, and a lot of people live in major cities and don't necessarily drive as much, and they have higher incomes. So, I, I, in general, you know, they, they might not not want this if they had that that choice. Uh, if you, if there were money that was going to go to states, you know, that might change the dynamic in some of these states to some degree degree, but I, I don't know if, if they would want it. However, say if there were a Republican president and he, you know, and he said, you know, we want uh, all areas to be open to leasing, I don't think states could do all that much outside of three miles to stop that. Um, I know the state senators and representatives would be screaming a lot, but I don't know if there's anything legal they could, could do to, to challenge that. Now, as for whether the revenue can be shared like that. I'll, I'll let David respond. Yeah, the um, it, under current law, the revenue cannot be shared, um, and so that requires uh, a change in Congress. And our royalty schemes are quite different, frankly. Um, uh, the Minerals Management Service and now uh, Honor and Bohm and Bessie all have um, the ability to do some varied uh, varied schemes, but traditionally the scheme is is very conservative with the small C, and that is that um, it's a, it's a uh, auction for a bonus bid, a bonus bid auction, and then a, a, a set royalty. Um, Oxla allows a variety of choices, but Interior and the Office of Management and Budget have always thought that the set royalty was uh, kind of the most conservative approach. Um, when you look at payments overall. Uh, then you add in taxes and other things. And there are a variety of studies, and I, Interior just did one uh, that's a subject of some debate on Capitol Hill right now about what is the actual take um, uh, in terms of the U United, U.S. government's take versus others, and that's, that's always an ongoing choice. Revenue sharing, we know that some governors have asked uh, to um, have areas open. Um, others have asked that they be open subject to um, economic um, incentives, i.e. revenue sharing. And certainly those areas of, of the um, Gulf uh, 
um, and Alaska that are um, currently having development feel very strongly that there should be revenue sharing. And there uh, since, since the 50s, at least, there's been a constant debate in Congress on that. Um, and uh, just as an aside, on federal lands onshore, the revenue is split one half to one half under the Mineral Leasing Act. So on BLM lands, uh, 50 cents of every dollar that comes in for a federal royalty uh, from uh, oil or gas well goes automatically to the state. Um, when they developed the Outer Continental Shelf uh, Leasing Act, they took a different perspective. And part of it was a residual from the fact that they had decided that the first three miles um, on most of the states, and then uh, <clears throat> three nautical models, miles um, on some of the Gulf states, um, would, would be uh, state waters, and then the area outside of that would be exclusively federal. Go ahead, Miss. Do we have? Hi, my name is Christine Mushanik. I'm with Height Analytics, a research firm here in town. Um, I have two questions, one sort of a high policy question, one a more technical question. Um, on the sort of high policy question, then, you know, similar to the gentleman's comments about the transboundary agreement with the U.S. and Mexico, do you think is there an effort in the Arctic region to have greater collaboration and coordination between the U.S. and Canada on offshore drilling in the Arctic? Um, what may that look like? Is it appropriate? What sort of degree of coordination is or is not taking place? And what kind of suggestions would you have in that area? And sort of how does Russia fit into this um, as a shared area? And do you want to hear my technical question now or come back to it? All right, technical question is on liability caps. Um, sort of the bar to remove them is generally gross negligence. Um, so sort of what do you, do you think that that gross negligence finding is an appropriate standard or should it be removed, um, changed in some way? Sort of how do you think the Justice Department thinks about it, particularly in the, the BP case? Is it, I know it when I see it, or is there a little more rigor behind that analysis? Well, the broader question is a, an embassy person here, but the boundaries have yet to have been settled in the Arctic. Uh, there's vast areas of the Arctic, though, that are clearly within Canadian jurisdiction. It's the margins. It's the Alaska-Canada uh, border is unsettled and the northern border with Denmark and, and Russia isn't settled. But there is no prospect of drilling in those areas in any event for quite some time. Um, and the, the real impediments are not, I don't think, intercompany uh, cooperation. It's settling ultimately the, the regulatory structure in the Arctic in Canada. And it's complicated by the fact that one, none of it is, is provincial in, uh, in all, most respects, and the other part, adjacent part, is run by the government of Canada as a, a, a territory. Uh, so I think the, that has to be resolved before you can even start talking about how you're going to cooperate with the U.S., but there's, some, there's an expert over there who could answer that question better than I. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, so there's something known as the law of the sea, as a treaty, and uh, the U.S. has not ratified it. Uh, but, I mean, in general, you know, it's accepted 200 nautical miles from your coast, that's, that's yours, and then there's a question about different continental shelves, and there's, what, five countries that are thinking about it, and there's eight countries that have some thing to do with the Arctic region. Uh, so there have been a couple of countries that have, that have dealt with, you know, what is their their waters, but mo most of the resources seem to be within the 200 nautical miles. The biggest oil resource is off the coast of Alaska, and it's definitely in, you know, definitely in Alaskan waters. Uh, the biggest gas resource is in the Kara Sea, which is definitely Russian waters. Uh, but there, there could be some uh, disagreements or s some areas. There's also just cooperation in terms of using technology, and. My guess is that Canada will look to the example of the U.S., because the U.S. may drill some exploratory wells this summer, whereas Canada isn't as close. Uh, one major difference is that Canada, in some cases, is considering drilling in deeper waters. So Shell is considering drilling at about 140 feet 
sometimes it gets close to a thousand feet or so in Canadian waters, and then that might be a different ball game. Um, yeah, on uh, I would like to address a point on the liability question first, and that is I, I think it's important to note that. Um, when you're talking about the liability cap, you are only talking about the liability cap on economic damages. And um, there is no liability cap on spill removal or non-economic damages. And so first, you need to cabinet, I think, from that context. And then, um, and then the, the question uh, was, um, should the uh, cap turn on gross gross negligence uh, or willful misconduct. And I think as a matter of fact, um, currently under the law, it also, um, the, the standard is also dependent on the, whether or not there's a violation of an applicable federal safety uh, construction or operating regulation as well. But do you want to speak to that as a policy question? Well, I know with BP, I don't think it's necessarily a liability cap issue because that's already been lifted. The question is just how big the fine's gonna be. And there's a question whether they're gonna be fined $1,100 a barrel or $4,300 a barrel, <laughs> which is a difference of fi about $15 billion, given how much was spilled. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that seems important, <coughs> but I'm not sure always the relevance to the liability cap. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. One of the things that James uh, raised uh, in his paper was the construct of either debarring future bidders, if you will, or increasing uh, civil penalties. And I do think it's important to recognize that under current law, uh, if there are uh, violations of the act, um, the government does have the option of um, stepping in um, and to the point of um, certain procedures for canceling leases. Uh, good morning, Ponciano Manalo with uh, Register Larkin Energy. Um, this is more on the Canadian side. Um, I see the benefit of uh, goal-based uh, regulations in terms of offshore drilling, but um, I'm just wondering from the company's perspective, how do you come? How do you convince the companies that, say, an accident does happen, um, the the government is not going to come back and say you didn't do this, then you, this you are now liable for these for these accidents. Um, even though they've up to this up to a certain point, they've they've fulfilled their their obligations. But maybe due to financial constraints or something, they might not have had the up the latest technology available. So how do you convince companies to come into offshore drilling and say, okay, well, uh, we're going to do this, but you know, at, at on the back end, maybe the um, the problems with goal based uh, re um, regulations. Uh, may, may, may in turn uh, uh, hamper us in the end in terms of investment? I don't think it's the correct uh, question in a sense that um, there's only two questions. Was the company negligent or was it not? Um, it doesn't matter if it complied with the regulations. It, it, it ticked off every box in the regulations and it was still negligent, then it's going to be liable and non limited cap. So Compliance with regulation is not a waiver of your liability. I've, I've done all the things I'm supposed to do in the regulation, therefore I'm now forgiven if I, if I screw up. It's, it's not the way it works. Um, in, in Canada, there's no cap uh, if you're negligent. Put another way, there's a cap of 30 million if it's an act of God, it's something you could not have reasonably anticipated. I can't imagine a circumstance where that occur. I tell my clients if a meteor hits your rig, maybe. <laughs> So there is no cap. So uh, I guess the answer to your question in short is there is no um, waiver of your liability because you comply with regulations. It's still a negligence test like driving your car. The other thing, though, uh, one, a stat I, I, I want to mention, this, this industry has been operating in offshore Newfoundland and Labrador for 20 years, and there's been 1,000 barrels of oil spilled. So sometimes, you know, the catastrophic event can overshadow the fact that this is a very uh, safe industry. I always remember when I was a teenager dumping the oil in my backyard after I mowed the lawn. I mean, it's just a different world now. And a thousand, a thousand barrels of oil over 20 years and hundreds of millions of barrels is a very, 
uh, amazing record, really. Heather Roth, Resources for the Future. Two things. Uh, on the U.S., our continental shelf, royalties are gross. They're not net of costs. And carrying on from that, uh, MMS never had a stake in bonuses or royalties. MMS never had a conflict of interest with revenues. What happened here is what Mr. McDonald described in Canada. Two, um, catastrophic spills are rare, but the initial steps that start accident sequences happen all the time. And so as a part of risk management, what you learn is monitor performance, collect data, learn lessons, improve results. You didn't say anything about collecting more data on operations as they're actually occurring. Uh, and so I wonder, that hasn't figured in any of the reform efforts, as, as you've noted here. But it is an important part of improving performance offshore. Have you been involved in any discussions, any of you, on uh, getting better real-time reporting data from operators so that you can see as these things develop, the cement fails, the mud, uh, the blowout preventer, the different um, uh, initial steps that happen. Uh, have you, uh, what do you think it would take to get better reporting so that uh, we could begin to do some uh, risk oversight there. Yeah, I don't know. I think the only paper that I saw on, on the topic was at the USAEE conference uh, by someone from Resource for the, for the Future. So I, I really don't know mu much about it. I, I mean, the only comparison I know is FAA has like close calls. Uh, you know, if planes get too close together. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of dynamic instruments, so it's possible that, that some data could be collected. I'm, I'm really just not sure. I, I know in the Chevron well, which was the deep water well, the first very deep water well off Canada, 2,800 meters, um, there was a requirement for weekly meetings, and the data from the well is, is required to go to the board immediately. Now, I think the more interesting part of your question is, is these situations can occur in minutes. And I don't think even if the data is going to some technical expert at the board, it'll be at the weekend, it'll be after hours. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's a very interesting question. How real is real time? I mean, how, how, how much do you want the regulator actually monitoring real time information? So I understand the Gulf of Mexico, this ran out of control very, very quickly. So it's a good question. I, I just don't know how, how the regulator would what do you do with the information? Does that require 24-hour monitoring? Uh, what do they do if they see something anomalous as opposed to the companies? And to me, look at the Gulf of Mexico situation. There's a lot of motivation already built into the system to, for companies to do this themselves and with an oversight of the regulator. In my experience with the industry, uh, if there's a catastrophic event or even a less catastrophic event, there's personal ruin involved there is corporate room. Uh, there's a lot of motivations to do the right thing, and I'm not sure how much real-time, day-to-day oversight is going to change that. I mean, uh, BPs, people's lives were ruined, and uh, I, I think by a larger fine or, or more oversight by a regulator, it still wouldn't motivate the behavior any more than the personal responsibility for what, have, what has occurred. You know, you, you raised uh, two very interesting points, I think. Uh, first, on the conflict of interest issue. I, I, I really appreciate your comment that there's n there was no inherent conflict of interest between uh, MMS and, uh, as it was currently previously constituted. And the question I would ask James about that is, 
What, what happens now, if you believe there is a conflict of interest in that old structure, the new structure just has two people who report up to one different person. And so it is all, if there is a conflict of interest, it still remains housed within the Department of the Interior. Um, Canada has looked at that and said, we want to kick it not only out of interior, if you will, but out of that uh, federal government. And if you do perceive that there is a conflict, isn't something more than merely moving it within the office of the Secretary of the Interior, um, just perpetuating, uh, failing to perpetuate the conflict that you believe you have? And there's always going to be different values that, that you have in a, in a government. I mean, you know, you want to promote economic growth and you want to promote the environment, and sometimes those are in, in conflict. I think it, it was a good step to at least divide these roles. The MMS director you know, spent, you know, at least according to the report, the majority of his or her time dealing with on the revenue side and couldn't devote as much attention to uh, safety and, and oversight. And I think it's, it's good that you have people who can devote all their time to trying to achieve that particular value, even if there are different values. That but you you've taken an organization of 8,000 people and divided it into three. So it's not like, and, and you're going to add a few people, it's not like the people have really changed. Well, there are the twice, as much, twice as many inspectors, and you have twice as much money, and that, that, right. doesn't, that doesn't hurt. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, there is not one overall goal. I mean, there, there's going to be competing interests always, and I, I think this at least makes a, a clearer delineation, which I think is helpful. Any other questions? Um, one of the differences that came up in the publication, specifically Sandy talked a lot about engaging the local populations, and part of that has to do with the federal structure of Canada versus the federal structure of the United States. But you spent a lot of time on that. And interesting, James in his, um, his response to the, uh, Sandy's article said, um, it's not certain whether greater participation at the local level in the United States would promote better regulation. Um, and I'd like him to expand on that if he could. <clears throat> Well, uh, so, so right now, most offshore drilling occurs in, in Texas and Louisiana, uh, which are states not known for particularly strict regulations, and there's a very powerful industry force there. So uh, probably the, there will be a closer oversight if this occurs at, at a federal rather than, than state level, uh, at least in, in those uh, states and, there, and there's no way that you can, you know, just take a couple states and say, oh, you know, you have one regulatory system there and another regulatory system's all right for the the East Coast. So I think it's better at the federal level. Uh, an important distinction, though, in Canada, the royalty is collected by the province. The regulations are are made in Canada with the consent of the province. So there's one set of regulations. There isn't multiple regulations. The government and Nova Scotia can't do one thing and the government of Newfoundland can't do anything else. And there's also another important distinction is that the provincial vetoes over certain items drop off if Canada is not a net exporter of, of energy. So while security supply is, is an issue in Canada, the federal government has the hammer. Nothing to do with the royalties. The royalties is completely separate. There's a political accommodation by legislation, not a constitutional change, could be done in the U.S that allocates revenues at the administration and collection of revenues from royalty and the type of royalty to the adjacent state. So it's not a massive structural change you would require in the U.S. Constitution. It's, a, it's just an act of Congress that essentially does that. Uh, and I agree with the comment you made. If the same agency, this, there's either a conflict or there isn't. And if there is a conflict, um, then I'm not sure how this window dressing has really solved it. If there isn't, and I, I take your point, if, if most of the leases are gross, you know, there's no discussion of costs, there's no disallowance of costs, right. it's difficult to see how that creates conflict. There isn't, why would it come up? It's just the production number times the... Uh, Precisely. Um, I'm Bill Irwin with Chevron. Thank you very much for this program. Um, my, my question is a little bit out of right field, and it, it's brought on by, uh, by a, a slide both of you showed in the beginning of your presentations that, that uh, 
showed the uh, the offshore uh, the OCS um, leasings, if you will, on on um, on the United States, and and I was I was taken by the the lack of uh, of of leasing and hence development off of the east coast of excuse me the west coast of Florida, and and what's brought on by the lack of industrial capacity there. So my my, my question is really a industry capacity and policy question, kind of in the nexus of that, and it it. Um, it, it sort of recognizes a deep water prowess that, that both the U.S. and Canada has, and, and recognizes that um, that 75 miles south of the state of Florida is some deep water drilling going on uh, by Cuba, uh, and it's it's uh, if I'm not mistaken, 75 miles from Florida is closer than Macondo was to the United there States undone, shoreline. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, certainly issues when you think about the way the Gulf currents work and then the Gulf Stream works, Works there should be significant concern up the Atlantic coast of Florida. Um, yet this, this, this uh, development's happening in Cuba and because of the U.S. policies towards Cuba, there's not really a lot of U.S. presence there. They, even with the drilling rig that the European company is using, had to cobble together in a Rube Goldberg kind of way, drilling apparatus to make sure that the U.S. content was below 10 percent. Um, and, and there's probably risks inherent in that also. Uh, but my, my, my question is uh, um, kind of threefold. One, what is, uh, what is the sort of capacity to respond to incidents that might occur during, what is the international, so the U.S. and the Canadian capacity to respond to incidents that might occur there in offshore Cuba? Uh, uh, what, what are the things that can be done in the short term should the think unthinkable happen? And that's that sort of living with the policies we have right now. And two, uh, recognizing that Cuba might have a deep water offshore industry should they find commercial reserves and, and get them operating. What are in, in the midterm are some policy things we ought to think about so that there could be effective global response should the unthinkable happen in the future? <laughs> Uh, so I, I do think this would be primarily a, a U.S. thing. I don't know if, if Canada would get in, involved unless there there needs to be some involvement given the embargo uh, with with Cuba. I mean, at least with Florida, 125 miles was said. I know, say like uh, Bill Nelson, not not, not Ben, uh, from from Florida has been a vocal opponent of any drilling. 125 miles, but off Cuba, you know, there, there are fewer things that the U.S. can do to prevent that. Uh, now there is a containment vessel, which, uh, if it works properly, hopefully could contain a well quite quickly in case of a blowout preventer failure. But there's policy issues getting that there. Yeah, getting that there, uh, yeah, I, I guess we need the, the Cuba Institute to uh, to do this rather than the Canada Institute. Or you, you ship it via Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I'm not familiar enough with with U.S. Cuba policies and exactly what what can do. I, I I knew pretty much what you described in your your question about the regulators going on the the Repsol rig. Um, do you want to respond in any way in particular? Well. It, it raises an interesting question on emergency response and how, what are the regulatory requirements for emergency response? In Canada, there's a requirement before you drill to have a tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is local, tier two is national, tier three is you don't have national resources to deal with it. Um, how that applies if someone's drilling in Cuba and ignoring all that, I don't know. Don't have a clue. I, I, think, um, I, I think that this. Um, factual situation that you've highlighted really goes to Sandy's uh, point of the consequence of uh, prohibiting leasing in your own backyard doesn't mean that, that the challenges associated with oil and gas development um, on both the positive or the negative go away. And um, you know, here's the official response that you will get. The Coast Guard will do everything in its power uh, to deal with a uh, with an incident should it happen. The question would be, what is everything in its pa power and will it matter? And then secondly, uh, if, if you believe there's a threat 75 miles off the coast of Florida from an uh, ecological standpoint, 
um, you know, but you're willing to accept that, what is, what is the basis uh, in the Eastern Gulf for there not being development? And it's very simple, it's pol politics. I think we're about done. Why don't we take one more question? Is there? Um, on the praxis between goals based regulation and the more prescriptive traditional kind, it strikes me you might have a challenge in that all extractive industries, be they onshore or offshore, are challenged and increasingly challenged on the issue of public acceptance and social license. And, and when, I, when I reflect on Macondo, it strikes me that the perhaps initial public reaction is to like that prescriptive side and you know those those, those buggers in government better be watching those those buggers in industry and all of that I'm just wondering how do you deal with the public aspect of convincing and 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 from your comments the UK has been successful Norway's been successful we seem underway in Canada but any thoughts on on addressing that issue of social license and 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 trying to show people why goals-based regulation is better than a more prescriptive model? Um, I don't think it's a particularly challenging effort. I don't think anyone understands the difference. Even people in the industry don't really understand the difference. Um, and if you had to sell it, when you read a goal-based regulation, it makes more sense intuitively and logically to people than a prescriptive regulation. So for example, in the drilling regulations in Canada, there's a, a, a section of three paragraphs dealing with um, control of the wellhead during drilling. And it has broad statements of principle that the companies shall maintain control of the well, shall take all necessary steps to ensure to do so. So I, I don't think from a, a, from a selling to the public, a prescriptive regu uh, uh, goal-based regulation is going to be difficult at all, uh, as long as people understand what in fact they are. And I don't think anyone does. Uh, I, I, really don't. I, I think you have a pretty good point there. Uh, yeah, because you're saying the, the industry, right, should, yeah, I, I, exactly. So I think what what uh, what I, at that point I think Bomer is doing was pretty good. So yeah, they're moving toward this goal-oriented regulation. But probably the most obvious thing was this drilling safety rule, which is primarily prescriptive. I mean, goal-oriented and prescriptive regulation is not an either-or thing. You can definitely have prescriptive regulation. So. You know, do whatever you want for safety, but you have to have guardrails. In. You know, I mean, you you can have both, and it, it's clear that the the regulator is doing more. Uh, I mean, you would have to think about how it sounds to say, well, it's such a technical field, and we can't keep up with all the details, and that's why we're letting industry do this goal based regulation. That might sound pretty bad uh, from from a public relations standpoint. But if you do both, so you, and you still have some prescriptive things that you can clearly identify to the public, I don't think there'll be a, a huge backlash. You know, it's my perspective that the term safety in the oil and gas industry uh, really refers, was, was focused on the safety of humans. And the safety case, I think, really stems from a response uh, to the tragedy of the Piper Alpha in the North Sea. And, um, you know, it wasn't really initially developed as an environmental uh, program. It was a, a workplace safety program. And the, and the question, I think, um, that one has to ask is, number one, uh, do the countries that employ the safety case actually have more safety? I mean, i.e., fewer fatalities, that type of thing. So I think that's one question. I think from a policy perspective, when people advocate for it, to a certain extent, what they're, re what they're saying, because I agree that no one knows the difference, um, I think what they're really saying is how do we reset the precautionary principle in a way that puts the risk, you know, we, we need to make sure of everything, whatever everything is, before we proceed forward. And it's really a question of what degree of risk you're, and how you assess that risk and where you set the, the going forward point in time. And, and there are compelling um, policy views in either way. I mean, I think you can say very clearly there is a great interest on the, on the operator side to not make a mistake. There are significant consequences to that. You can also say, as a matter of policy, this is what we want to um, require before we go forward in terms of making a question about that risk. And ultimately, the consequence of those choices 
is how rapidly um, and how robustly our resources are developed. And I think with that, I will close the program. So thank you very much. I think it was wonderful, two wonderful presentations. So thank you.